Hi everyone, Philip here again. It's in the afternoon having a nice cup of tea. Probably a little bit hot, just burned my lips. Thinking about the, the wonderful word disillusioned today. And I'd like to dedicate this video to my parents who have taught me uh, about disillusionment in all the right ways. So if I use that word disillusioned, what emoticons would go with that? Uh, you know, just imagine you send a text to your family member or friend or whatever and said, I'm just so disillusioned today. What's going to go as far as emoticons after that? Is it going to be, you know, sort of like face with thumbs down, smelly turd picture, whatever it is. Is it going to be those emoticons or is it going to be, you know, thumbs up, happy smiley face, um, you know, party bloom, uh, party pooper, party pooper, party blower thing, party hat. Is it going to be that one? So is it negative or positive? I asked my daughter this. We went for a quick walk around our local park with the dog and said, if I use the word disillusioned, what emoticons would you put up? And she was, you know, all the negative ones. And I said, well, why do you think that is? And if you think about the the word disillusioned. What do you think it means? She said, I guess it means you've lost your illusions. I said, yeah. Well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? She says, actually, I think that's probably a good thing. I think so too. I think disillusioned, when properly understood, would probably be thumbs up, party hat, smiley face kind of stuff. But there's a good reason why we don't feel that way. And this all relates to stage three, moving into stage four. In fact, it's kind of one of these things that we go through, moving through whatever stage of life, whether stages of life, stages of faith, stages of anything. We go through a process of disillusionment, which feels negative often, which is why when we, we talk about being disillusioned, it's with a sad face. But... It's this. It's a just a different side of a, of a coin called revelation, on which the other side would be enlightenment. So, revelation is something has been revealed, and it might make you feel shocked. It might also make you feel excited, depending on how you respond to that revelation. So, perhaps one illustration for this. I remember a story, in a, a book I had been reading about the development of science uh, through the ages, and uh, getting to the story of Albert Einstein, who, when he came onto the scene, he came into into physics with these radical theories: the theory of relativity, the theory that gravity has an impact on time and space and on light. But it was really hard to prove, and and it was, of course, not the the uh, acceptable theories of the time, and the leading physicists didn't um, see any reason why he would be right. He was able to demonstrate that he was on the money, though, when, and I'm a little vague on some of the details, just forgive me here, I think it had something to do with an event in which a star uh, uh, was, a star's gravity was shown to have bent light of another star behind it. Um, it was as, as if the stars kind of went, pop and you could tell that um, that that sudden jump was actually not a sudden jump but more the fact and it might have been the movements of planets or something but it was it was clearly it was clearly the, the better answer for what had just happened was that the gravitational effect of that that universal body that body in space had bent light around it and that helped demonstrate that Einstein's theories were accurate. The point of the story is this, that the, one of the leading physicists who witnessed this and understood that Einstein was under something and that all of the theories he had based his own understanding on were wrong, or at least needed to be radically reviewed, his experience of this revelation was one of great disillusionment to the point that he felt so discombobulated. He felt, I think his words were something to the effect of, it was as, as if the earth had suddenly become a, an abyss beneath my feet and nothing was stable anymore. Something like that. Now, understand that the reality he was dealing with, the real real, the world he was actually in, hadn't actually changed. He was totally fine. He didn't suddenly spin off into space, gasping without, you know, in an oxygenless environment. He was quite comfortably probably sitting at home thinking about these things. But... This experience for him, the existential crisis that realizing that the belief set he had 
was not real, or at least not real enough to deal with real real, was so disconcerting and, and disorienting that he felt as if his world had ended. That is the powerful negative emotions we get with disillusionment. Now, understanding, of course, and I'm sure that we would agree, to suddenly see or to, to come into a better understanding of how things really are probably leads to better outcomes for science and for, you know, for whatever the endeavor is related to that new understanding. It's going to improve things. So his response had a lot more to do with how he felt and his identity and, and who he was in the world rather than what it would mean for uh, science generally and etc. But that powerful sense of disillusionment leading to negative outcomes is, is or at least uh, negative, negative experiences for ourselves is one of the traumatic things of going through different stages of faith because what it, what it immediately of course it means if you move from one stage to the other is you realize the stage you were in didn't hold all the answers and that you need to grow, you need to discover new answers, you need to broaden your understanding. Uh, the difficulty with stage three moving to stage four is there is already a degree of maturity and sophistication in our approach and our understanding at that point. And depending on how quickly someone might be going through the stages of faith, they could be well into their 30s or 40s with stage three thinking before they begin to move into stage four and stage five, which means that you've been with that thought, that thought pattern a long, long time. And we don't give up our ideas very easily. We would probably experience some of those some of those feelings in the same way that that physicist did, that it was as if the world no longer had any stability and reliability and it felt very, very scary and vulnerable. Um, but without disillusionment, there can be no enlightenment. Um, I've dedicated this to my parents, not because they are disillusioned people in the negative sense, but because they are they are the positive example of what it means to to continue to process and assess and review what you were raised with and and what you thought of in your twenties and what you began to think of in your thirties and what you began to think in your forties and so on. They for me are one of those examples, one of those rare and very courageous examples of people and, and there are others of course that I, that I know of but I just want to dedicate this to my parents because they're a particularly good example um, continue to assess and reassess what they believe what they're standing on what they think is real in their own lives in their in their life of faith um, in their relationship together in their relationship with others um, they are honest in, in, in many very good ways and and I, and I know it's been traumatic at times it's been very difficult at times uh, however, it's also been um, a real growth journey and a real journey of discovery. And they are people who I would, without hesitation, recommend to anyone else who wanted to find, uh, who wanted to grow in their faith and in their understanding and develop as humans. I would, without hesitation, recommend them as people who would help you go through that journey. Uh, they've been incredibly valuable to me as a first as a son and and and. Um, and now I see them more in, um, as a mentor to me in those ways. Um, and so I'm incredibly privileged in that, and I know that. Um, because what disillusionment can do for you, and which is what I see in my parents definitely, is it leads you from a, uh, it leads you into deeper commitment. Another illustration might be really helpful here. Uh, marriage is a great example of what I really want to be talking about in this process. So you you find someone whom you fall in love. There's a, there's a deep attraction and um, you court and you find that, yes, this is the person I want to give my the rest of my life to. Now, that's a major decision. That's a, a deep act of faith. You are, you are basing it on a, on a whole lot of understandings. You are drawing on a lot of information, how they treat others, how you see them in their family, what their family environment is like the times that you talk together, seeing them in stress, you know, how you dealt with your first argument. You draw on a lot of information in order to make that decision. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a big leap of faith because you don't know what they're going to be like in 20, 30, 40 years or, or even what you're going to be like for that matter. So marriage is a, a big leap of faith. And we know that uh, sadly it does end uh, for, I mean, I don't know what the percentages are, but they're pretty high in divorce for a lot of people. They, they don't survive that journey. Um, at least not all not all first marriages survive that um, that journey to, to full term, which would be you know until death do us part. 
Um, just one moment. What happens in marriage and happens in faith and happens in life, we have a honeymoon phase. We, we make a decision and we see in the other person uh, something I suppose that we need to see. We need to see, well, like, you know, as far as me marrying my wife, you know, 1998, in a way, I wasn't just marrying a woman. I was marrying all womanhood, all womankind. I mean, she was, she was going to be the woman and the only woman for me in that way for the rest of my life. So I was, she represented the very best of, of the, <laughs> the female realm. Um, I was choosing the very best woman I could choose and I'd made a good choice. And, and she, in, 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 a, in a kind of deep and ro- overly romanticized and idealized way, represented all women and all women to me. And probably, largely, I was all mankind to her. I was the, I was the man, um, not just a man. And, and you marry and you have this home and experience and you realize, yes, they are perfect. But given enough time, right, you realize that, that they are not the woman. They are a woman. I am not the man. I am a man. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I haven't married the woman. I have married a woman. And I have committed myself to a woman, not all women, for the rest of my life and the rest of her life. And that realization comes with... Um, comes through lots of disconcerting disillusionment moments when you realize, oh, they didn't handle that situation very well, or um, they didn't read my needs as well as I thought they would, or gosh, why is it I'm the only one who ever apologizes in this relationship, or you know, <laughs> whatever it might be, fill in your blank. Um, but the period of time, you know, spend enough time with someone, you realize that They may be a very good example of their kind, but they're not the perfect example. They're not all examples put into one. Um, They are limited human beings, and that's disconcerting because we do marry, and whether we realize it or not, with this kind of underlying hope that they're going to be all all that we need. And, And we discover that they're not, that they have flaws and and they are limited. And um, they cannot meet every need in our lives. Now, of course, you can hear and, and me talking, you can think, my goodness, what a selfish human being. Thinking that I, you know, you're marrying someone for what you can get out of it. Well, yeah, welcome to the real world. That's what we do. Of course, you want to give yourself to that other person. That's, that's also part of the grand adventure. You want someone to whom you could just give all yourself to. But they can't take all of you. And, and you know what? All of them isn't enough for you. So you're left with feeling like perhaps you're disillusioned. I thought it was going to be better than this. I thought marriage was going to solve our problems. I thought that, you know, the, the classic story, we had a difficult difficult um, courtship, but I loved them. And I thought, well, if I married and committed, it would have become better. Um, and then discovered that over time, there were more issues that I had to deal with. Well, then, so we thought we'd have children and that would grow our love. We would love our children. That would bring us together. <laughs> Only to find that it pulls us into bigger issues and bigger problems and more stress and more tiredness and that just exacerbates the problem. Classic, classic real world stuff. This is real world stuff. But what it does mean, when you are disillusioned and you realize, oh my goodness, this is not going to be easy. It's not going to be a natural thing for me to love this person for the rest of their life or mine. Uh, There are reasons why this might be difficult and I can see them and they're beginning to manifest in more and more ways. What am I going to do? If this decision, which seemed easy when when we courted and we proposed and decided to, to wed... Now seems a lot harder. What am I going to do? Now, this this is the important thing about disillusionment. This is why it's so crucial to growing up. What it challenges us to is to make an actual commitment. Now, you thought when you married that, that was the actual commitment. Um, and unfortunately, in a, in a world like ours where divorce is so readily acceptable, uh, the idea of that being a commitment or the commitment has probably been eroded a lot. But I suspect most people go into marriage with that expectation or certainly hope that this is the one decision they need to make as far as who they're going to be with for the rest of their life. I don't think anyone marries thinking or hoping or expecting to divorce. Um, though I, I'm sure that, that the fact that it's so uh, acceptable now makes it easier to pull out of a relationship if it's not kind of working out as you hoped. 
but that's the point really of disillusionment. That's that's why it's so critical in our growth and maturing because at that point we have to make a decision, make an, a, a commitment, and not just you know today. Well, I'll, well, I'll love you today, but I'm going to have to make that same commitment tomorrow. I'm going to have to make it on and on and on. And it, it's you know how do you know when you're faithful? Well, probably at the end of your life can you know really whether you're a faithful person. Um, because faithfulness is making that commitment every day for the rest of your life that you will make it work with that person and hoping that, of course, they'll do the same for you because it does take two. But that's what faithfulness is. It's a commitment over and over again, deepening that relationship, deepening that commitment to stay together. And you, and faith only really exists in, a, in, a, in its deepest sense in that context. It was kind of a faith leap when you decided to, to wed. But because it wasn't fully disillusioned, you had a lot of illusions and a lot of romanticism and a lot of idealism built into it. You were hoping it was going to be a lot easier than it really turned out to be. Um, you were hoping you wouldn't have to make a difficult decision about continuing on with that person. Um, and the disillusionment process of real life relationships showed that that wasn't going to be enough. It wasn't going to be an easy, natural decision. You were going to have to make your own will decision. Seeing everything clearly now with the revelation of who you really are and how shallow you are and who they really are and their flaws, can you persist? And when you say yes, that's how you build faith. Faith is a long-term journey. And you can only really say that you've been faithful after 40, 50 years. Um, that's what faithfulness really is. It's not, well, I did it for 10 years and that should be enough. No, that's not faithfulness. That's trial and error. That's giving it a good shot um, and seeing where it goes. And the faith journey, of course, is very similar. And I kind of celebrate, to be honest, when someone says, I'm really disillusioned with the church. I think, well, good. Because you and your illusions about church are all that's wrong with the church. Coming into a church with illusions just means it's going to be a painful process for us all when you when you slowly wake up to the church being a flawed place because you're a flawed human being and you're surrounded by flawed human beings. And it's really hard to bear the burden of one another's romanticism and idealism about what church should be like. Um, when we lose the illusions even about what we think God is like. When we, th- when we think that if I just pray hard enough, if I ask, seek and knock, that it's going to be some sort of mathematical formula that means I'm going to get all my prayers answered and how I want life to be. Well, it's just not going to happen that way. This is a this is a faith that we, um, you know, where the central figure of it has said quite plainly, take up your cross if you want to follow me. It's not going to be an easy thing. Final thoughts. Um, we right now are working to refresh our uh, roadside sign um, for the church. It's been weathered. The sun here in New Zealand is pretty damaging and it's taken its toll. So the, the, it just looks tired and battered and it's time now to refresh it and tidy it up. And, um, and so that's good, right? That's that, that's just a, a, a good way to show that we care about the place. But I am a little ambivalent about it. I'm probably not the right person to want to do this, even though I spent 10 years in PR and marketing and I'm not actually responsible for the sign at all. Um, I'm ambivalent from a pastoral point of view, and here's why. First reason, and it's the least reason, is I don't really think the church should get into a situation where it's trying to promote itself as if it's just another alternative to what you might do with your time or with your life. Um, As if you've got a list of things that you might want to do, you know, a checklist on your fridge, what could I do today? Um, where am I going to go? Who am I going to be with today? And you go, well, I could go with my friends to the park or I could go to the beach or I could go to church or I could go to, you know, to tonight, I could go to life group, whatever. A checklist of all these things that you could do depending on how you feel. And I just don't think that the church should be caught up in that game. For one, the church, if we really understood it properly, it's not the place you'd go to for that kind of constant good feel hit. The church is a challenging place to be, and and we've all got scars. If you've been around church long enough, you all bear the scars, and my parents bear the scars, and and yet um, their commitment to the church has has never been short of admirable, in my view, seeing what they've gone through. Um, They've never given up on the church as much as I know it causes them to tear their hair out at times. and I know that partly the reason they've never given up is because they also know what they're like. They know they're not perfect, and um, and 
know, that's a part of another story, but that's part of what I, why I wanted to dedicate this to them. Um, the second reason is, and um, this is you know, the more um, perverse part of me, I, if there was going to be a sign to, on the roadside to promote the church, I think it should, I think it should say, don't come to church, it's too hard. It's not for the average punter. It's not. It's not for the walk off the street kind of person. And now, in a way, in a real way, it actually is. You know, understood properly, the church is a, a, a difficult place because it's full of you know, full of sinners trying to work it out. If the church understands that, it's a wonderful place for a sinner to be a part of because the the grace and understanding and, and tolerance and mercy and generosity toward one another would be real and genuine because you'd realise. People are putting up with you just as much as you're putting up with them. There's a wonderful sharing of burdens there. But if it's if it's a place where you think it's, you know, we're trying to prove that we're much more, um, you know, an attractive place, an exciting place, a place that you want to be part of, you know, sort of upbeat and that kind of thing, um, in the way that we're trying to compete with an environment of, of great entertainment, it tends to have the opposite effect. It tends to, to create people who feel like they're always on show and they have to be upbeat about things and have to pretend as though everything's better than it really is. Um, and I don't, you know, those two things work in a, in a kind of a, a, a natural um, disharmony for me, anyway. And uh, the, the the process of disillusionment, um, I think, is such a good antidote to all of that. You know, we 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 know that being part of the church is hard. We know that being a follower of Christ is hard. It's it's, it's taxing. It's commitment um, commitment high, commitment heavy. Uh, Jesus calls us to follow him by taking up our cross. And when the illusions are stripped away about who we really are and, and actually what it's going to cost to be part of that church, we have this chance to commit and, and commitment makes it more real. And it's what faith looks like. It's what faith feels and sounds like. It's making a choice over and over again that, yes, I am going to be part of this even though it's hard, even though it's not as rewarding as I wished it was, even though I had all of these hopes and dreams for it, and they just don't seem to be coming uh, to fruition, that God himself doesn't seem to be meeting my needs as I expected him to. Nevertheless, faithfulness is showing up over and over again, being part of it still, even though it hurt, um, forgiving the person who trod on your toes and, and bruised your feelings and all of those sorts of things, and, and even going to seek forgiveness from others when you know that you've done wrong. Those are hard things, and they're also in some ways very simple, basic kind of how we get along with one another. Um, but it's, it's evident to me that not only is the divorce rate really high for a good reason, but so is the the exit stage right with church thing quite high for very similar reasons. This disillusionment that we don't seem to process very well. Anyway, it's a bit longer than I expected or hoped. Um, nevertheless, I do pray that it was useful. God bless. See you soon.